friends. Welcome to Sky House Herbs podcast. I'm Ashley Ellen Voss, a clinical herbalist. And in this space, I share my knowledge and experience with plant medicine to help you on your own journey of healing and transformation. Join me in exploring the ancient wisdom of plant spirit medicine and how it can be used to heal the body, mind, and spirit. We'll talk to experts in the field and share stories from people who've been transformed by powerful plant allies. New episodes are released each Monday, so please subscribe. And now let's explore this mystical world of plant medicine together. Hey everyone, welcome in. Today we'll be talking about peppermint in our Herb of the Month series. I love peppermint. It has so many amazing qualities and actions. It's easy to find, easy to grow. We'll talk about all of that. We'll also talk about some of the research that's been done on peppermint oil, IBS treatment, energy performance, tons of wonderful things. So I'm excited to get into that with you. Before we begin today's talk, I would love if you could just take a moment to subscribe to my channel. Subscribing to my channel helps other people to find me and it also makes sure that you will get notifications if you click notifications that will let you know when my new videos come out. I put out videos once a week. If I see y'all are liking them, I might start putting out more, including more hands-on classes and um, episodes where you can see me in the kitchen making various herbal remedies. But for today, I have a bunch of things here. You probably, you can't see them, but I will show you one by one peppermint leaf, dried, fresh, and we'll talk about all of that. All right. So thank you. Welcome in. Peppermint. So the Latin name for peppermint as we classically know it is mentha piperita. And peppermint is actually a hybrid variety. And it's said that nobility thousands of years ago, or like over the course of thousands of years, they started to hybridize different mint family plants to get this very sweet smelling mint that we call peppermint today. The likely combination was mentha Mentha aquatica, a water-loving mint, which grows wild throughout most of the world, um, especially in Europe and here in North America, and then also mentha uh, spirata, and, um, or is it spica? Spicata, I was close. <laughs> Spicata. And those two together make what we know of peppermint today. And one of the tricky things about peppermint is if you go to your local plant nursery, you might not be able to find, it might, you might have a hard time finding mentha piperita because it's been so hybridized. Usually you'll see there's like thousands of varieties. The good news is that we can use all of these varieties equally. So whether you're using, you know, you know, peppermint or you're using um, chocolate mint or apple mint, they all have very similar properties. However, I would say if you can get just straight up peppermint or mentha piperita, and I'll tell you, I'll show you what it looks like, that is going to have the highest amount of the volatile oils and the menthol that make it do the things that we'll talk about it doing today. So... This herb is in the mint family. I want to show you what it looks like. This is from my garden. Um, it is a very, you know, this plant likes to grow and it likes to spread. I even pulled out some of the roots so that you could see. Um, so here we have the roots and I want you to notice that the roots grow down and then look at the leaves are growing. So these actually spread horizontally through the soil. So if you don't want to have a ton of mint, that could be peppermint, lemon balm, anything in the mint family, a lot of our classic mints, they spread pretty readily through these very um, kind of, they're not very deep, they're kind of superficial growing roots. They grow right along the surface and then they send these root little rootlets down. And then all of this will start growing up. You can even see here on this stem, how it's growing new plants. So this stem was going horizontal. This one started growing vertical, but it's gonna just keep growing and keep spreading and snaking its way through the garden. And it's long been associated um, planetarily with the energy of Venus. Um, and that's because of its aroma. It's beautiful. I mean, the mints, especially all the mints in the mentha family, uh, they're all, they all have this very characteristic um, 
pungent, aromatic, slightly sweet smell. And it's interesting to note that in ancient Europe, peppermint wasn't really used as a medicine as much as it was for baths, for perfumes. They use peppermint to wash their bed sheets, um, mop the floors. I mean, it was really something that was grown um, and you know, grown for its scent and usually its fresh plant material scent. It was used by um, you know, Hippocrates and other ancient herbalists as a medicine for things mostly related to digestion. But it was, um, you know, its widest uses were as a flavorant and also as a perfume for daily use. And it really is a beautiful flower. Um, it's got this purple flower. And, and one of the ways you can tell the difference between peppermint and say another mint family plant like uh, lemon balm is that peppermint has a purple flower, whereas lemon balm has a white flower. And also peppermint, which is a little different, has usually a darker stem. And you can see that the stem is kind of reddish purple and the leaf veins are very deep. And when we look at plants like spearmint, spearmint is more green. It doesn't have this purplish hue to it. And the leaf veins are not as dark and they're a little bit, the leaf, um, like width is actually a little bit wider and the edges aren't quite as sharp and jagged. So if you if your nose can't tell it, your eyes should be able to then notice the difference. Now, I also wanted to show you the difference between freshly dried peppermint and not freshly dried peppermint. So this is some peppermint leaf I bought from Mountain Rose. I love Mountain Rose for buying bulk herbs. Now, so there, um, this I purchased in 2008. So to nine to 10 to 11, 12. So this is six years old. So to be fair to Mountain Rose, I probably when I got this, it didn't look this color, but now it has. And I, I just wanna show you that peppermint freshly dried should not look brown. It should look like this, green. So let me just show you side by side. So if you go to your apothecary store, your local herb store, and you buy peppermint and it's brown, just pass it up and say, no, thank you. Because you can easily grow it yourself, dry it yourself. This is mine from last year and it's still really green. So just as a note that when, you, when it starts to turn brown like this, it still has some scent to it. I'm not gonna throw it away, uh, but I might, you know, it's gonna take a lot more and probably double or triple the amount of this brownish one to this freshly dried one to get the same medicinal effect. So just, I think that's really important for us as herbalists to have our eye on quality. Now we can use peppermint both dry and fresh. And I'm gonna show you how I like to use it. There's two different ways I like to brew peppermint as a tea. And you can do it either dried or you can do it fresh as I mentioned. And I'm just going to turn my camera downward so you can see what I'm doing. There's my microphone. We'll just move her to the side. So this is the pot that I love. I use this pretty much every day and it's, I'll include a link. I bought it on Amazon. So I'll include a link for you. It comes in a bunch of different colors. If you don't like the blue, it has this really nice straining um, strainer in it that comes in and out. And I love how big it is. So I can put a lot of plant material in here. Now when making a peppermint tea, this is, um, this is actually chocolate mint and it doesn't look that different from the peppermint, but the smell is just a little bit, uh, has a little bit more of that vanilla cacao smell. And what I like to do is I like to just strip it off the stem. So I take all the leaves, strip it off the stem, and then I just hand pulverize it. And I'm just gonna rip it. And I, I don't really like to keep long nails, but just enough nail to where I can use it like a little scissors. And I'll just break open the cell walls, which will help with extraction. And I can smell it, the medicine's already coming. I'm gonna mix in a little bit of this fresh leaf here. Oh, it smells very different. This one's way more potent, this actual uh, peppermint. So I'm going to break it up and, you know, I'm, I'm not going to make a huge glass for myself. So I probably did, let's just show you, it's filled to about here. So I maybe have like a few tablespoons of fresh herb. Let me just throw in a few more leaves because, because I can. And I like my herbs a little bit stronger. So we're just going to do that. And then I've got my electric kettle here, which I swear by electric kettles. If you don't have one, oh my goodness, it makes life 
so much easier. I'm just gonna pour my hot water over the herb, cap it, which is very important because with plants that have lots of volatile oils, if you don't cap it, then those volatile oils will come off in the steam and get carried into the room. And what you want is you want the volatile oils to collect on the top here and condensate and then drip back in to your tea. So that way you're capturing them and putting them back where you want them, which is gonna be eventually in your belly. Now, the other thing that I really like to do is just to make drinking water. And so this is a really easy way to use peppermint as well. I'm gonna strip the leaves off. I'm gonna do the same thing as I'm just gonna use my nails and I'm gonna rip it up. I'm gonna even add the flower in and I'm gonna rip that up a little bit. Oop. Put that back in. I can use a little bit of this tender stem because it does have volatile oils. And I'm gonna get all of the herbs off, rip them, open them up. And then I don't have water right here, but I'm just gonna pour like room temperature water over these herbs. And I don't have to cap it or put anything over it because it's not gonna, there's you know, nothing is going to be, um, evaporating out because there's no heat, but I can just let this sit. And last night, um, we actually went out to the garden. It was a, a full moon lunar eclipse and we made moon water. That was really fun. So we just went around the garden. We gathered plants by moonlight. We put them into a, we used a huge jar for our whole family. And then I filled it up. Um, actually, I brought the jar down there filled with water, uh, filtered water, ideally. And, um, and I put the herbs in and I put a leaf over the top so no bugs would get in. <laughs> and then I let that sit out under the light of the full moon eclipse. And then this morning, for breakfast. I poured glasses for me and my daughters and my husband. We all drank it and oh my gosh, it tasted so good. So you'll still get some of the subtle oils. They'll come into room temperature water. You don't have to make a hot tea. And that's a really nice way to use the fresh plant. So easy peasy lemon squeezy, as we like to say. And when, like, what do you use this for? What, what, why do we even make peppermint tea? Well, the classic indications for peppermint. Matthew Wood, one of my herbal teachers, says it's particular for people who have a hard time digesting or feel bloated or get headaches after meals. I think that's a really great way to think about it. If you, after you eat a meal, and it could be anything, you just don't feel well, or your energy drops down. That's another thing that Matthew taught me was like, you know, if your energy goes straight down and you get really tired and fatigued after you eat, peppermint will start to get the juices flowing. It'll help accelerate digestion and it will disperse blood flow back upward to to the head. Uh, so that's one way or one reason you might want to use peppermint is as a tea after a meal. You can also use it as a tea before a meal because it can help get the digestive juices flowing. I also like to use peppermint for fevers and colds. It is strongly mucolytic, which means it thins your mucus. So if you have like that super congested sinuses or sinus headaches from pressure from being stuffed up, peppermint is a wonderful herb. It will get in there and clear up that sinus pressure and help the mucus to drain out. It's also really helpful in fevers and it's part of a classic blend, like an rosemary glad star, um, just one of the, the classic herbal blends for fevers, which is yarrow, peppermint, and elderflowers together. I use that all the time. It's really, really nice with any sort of, whether it's a fever caused by a flu or a fever caused by a cold or a virus, which is all viruses. But you know, if you, if you start to feel like that feverish feeling coming on, those three herbs are wonderful. I'll try to write them out in the description. I know you all really like that. Uh, the actions of this herb, just to read a little list here. So it's antispasmodic, so it helps with any sort of cramps and spasms in the digestive system and in the muscles. It is antimicrobial. It is diaphoretic. So again, it helps mount that fever response. And really what it does is it helps you sweat. So it helps you open up your pores to release heat out of the body. It's a nervine. So it's a gentle relaxant for the nervous system. But it's interesting because there's a lot of studies I want to show you that actually show that it is um, also activating and stimulating. So we'll look at the difference of those things. And then it's analgesic. And this is a really nice way to use it for tooth pain. Just chew up a fresh leaf and stick it on. On that sore tooth. Um, you can use it as a muscle rub in a salve. So you could make an infused oil with peppermint leaves dried, 
remember. And uh, you can also use peppermint essential oil. And peppermint essential oil is different. It's not the same thing as the whole plant. Uh, it's a lot stronger. You do want to be a lot more careful when using essential oils. And um, I'm going to talk really here about using the actual plant material because I think it's safer. Um, the dosage is a little more generous. And, um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want anyone out there just dosing themselves with like drops and drops and drops of the essential oil. Um, I did want to tell you a story about peppermint and how it got its name and, and how it came to this earth from Greek legend. So peppermint has a long history of use dating back to ancient Greece. In an ancient Greek myth, the Greek god Pluto, who's the god of the underworld, was said to have affections for a beautiful nymph named Minthi. Minthi was a nymphae or a young girl. And these like these Ancient, in, in ancient Greece, the nymphs were symbols of nature, freshness, and long life. So they just symbolized like that youthful virgin, um, you know, kind of like ethereal energy. So Pluto, the god of the underworld, fell in love with this nymph named Minthi. And his jealous wife, Persephone, caught them together and cast a spell on the nymph, transforming her into a plant. When Pluto could not reverse the spell, he gave her a sweet scent that would emanate throughout the garden, reminding all of her beauty. And he didn't want her beauty to be lost because he was so captured by it. So I think there's also something about it reviving us from death or reviving us from um, the grips of depression and reviving us from all the Plutonian elements in our life, um, all of the, the hard work that we have to do as souls on this planet. It can be really nice to have an herb that reminds us of the fresh, youthful, invigorating energies that are also here, that are beautiful, that are light, that um, travel with ease, right? That's a very different energy than the underworld. So it's a beautiful contrast to that energy. Um, in Ayurveda, mentha and various mints were considered to be reducing to pitta, fire, and kapha, or earth and water, but it could be stimulating to vata, which was earth, or sorry, which was a wind and ether. Um, and what's really interesting to note about that is, you know, because it's kind of diffusive and airy, you know, it can be too much for people that tend to already be a little bit dispersed. So if you're already kind of like, ah, you know, I can't get myself together, then regular use of peppermint might not be like classically one, you know, it might not be classically indicated for you. But if you tend to be a little bit of more of like a fiery, take charge type A person, or if you tend to be a more kind of sedentary, slow digesting, you know, kind of like heavier, more earthy person, then peppermint might be a really good thing for helping move tension and anger. And then also at the same time, stimulating um, motivation and getting you going. So let me grab my book. This is a beefy book. I do love it. It's wonderful. It's called Urban Natural Supplements, an evidence-based guide by Leslie Braun and Mark Cohen. I'll include a link below. So I wanted to read some of the studies that have been done on peppermint because I know it, I love, I think it's important to know what were the historical uses, what were the stories associated with the plant to see the plant, but also like what does science have to say? So I wanted to say that um, a few things, this was really interesting about cigarettes. Like I remember I went through a phase where I smoked uh, cools. Do you remember those? Those menthol? I think, I mean, they probably still exist, but um, yeah, I went through a phase where I smoked menthols. So menthol has been investigated on its action for airway epithelium and was found to regulate CAMP activated uh, anion transporters and blah, 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 blah. This was the part I thought. Menthol's cold sensitivity response has been shown to inhibit mucosal recognition of nicotine and other cigarette toxins common in mentholated cigarette brands. So it actually dulls when we inhale menthol cigarettes or we inhale that mint, it actually kind of dulls our sense of taste and smell and sensitivity to nicotine. I don't, like, I'm like, well, you know, if you're going to smoke nicotine, I mean, why? I don't know. I don't, I'm not saying that they're better for you. I actually think that they're probably worse for you, <laughs> you know, just don't smoke cigarettes in general, but um, I thought it was interesting that that's one of the effects that it has is that it dulls your sensitivity to nicotine and these other chemicals that are in, in, included, probably because your body would be like, 
ah, <laughs> you know, like get the smoke out of me. Um, so the other thing that was interesting about this is that um, it re a second proposed mechanism, mechanism of action is to, let's see, it forms low viscosity mucus and contributes to overall mucociliary clearance. So one of the things that the, that the, um, the menthol in cigarettes does is it thins the mucus and allows you to cough it up more easily. And this is also why they have peppermint oil. There's studies that have in here as well about applying peppermint oil uh, topically in chest rubs and um, chest oils, and that actually being able to permeate to the lungs and thinning mucus and helping you cough it up. So that's the way I would recommend it. Like, don't smoke menthol cigarettes, but you can use the qualities, the mucolytic and mu mucus thinning qualities topically or by drinking hot peppermint tea. There's also a lot of clinical use on IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome. And one of the, um, you know, one of the primary signatures of IBS is when the intestinal muscles are contracting faster or more slowly than normal. And so they did a study where they had people swallow capsules of peppermint oil, and they found that there was a 29% success rate over placebo. So it was more helpful than placebo in people who were experiencing IBS symptoms, especially cramping and um, pain. Uh, so there were like five different studies that showed improvement in abdominal pain with a minimum treatment of two weeks. So that was pretty neat, I thought as well. Um, there are a ton of studies on infantile colic and gentle peppermint infusions being used to help with, um, with colic in babies. Topical application of a solution of 10% pep uh, peppermint oil in ethanol or alcohol. This is like basically a tincture uh, or peppermint oil in alcohol or tincture form has been shown in a randomized placebo controlled double blind crossover study to efficiently alleviate tension type headaches. The study analyzed 164 headache attacks in 41 patients of both sexes. Peppermint oil was spread largely across the forehead and temples repeated after 15 to 30 minutes. Using a headache diary, the headache parameters were assessed after 15, 30, 45, and 60 minutes. Compared, compared with the application of the placebo, the peppermint oil significantly reduced the intensity of the headache after 15 minutes. And then they said it was equal to 1,000 milligrams of of acetaminophen or like aspirin. So that's really neat to know. Uh, we also found that peppermint oil was investigated for its ability to enhance sports performance in male students. They took a drop of, they took 500 milliliters of mineral water and 0 0.05 milliliters of peppermint essential oil for 10 days. And they found that it increased their lung capacity. And again, this is all with the essential oil because it's very easy for scientists to track it and study it. But I would say this is going to be true for peppermint tea, hot infusion to get the most oils out. But I think we can look at all of this uh, peppermint enhanced cognitive performance. Peppermint odor has been shown to reduce daytime sleepiness in several studies to reduce fatigue and to improve mood. It promotes, it promotes general arousal of attention and improved typing speed and accuracy. In a recent study of healthy volunteers, peppermint oil inhalation enhanced memory and alertness when measured by the Cognitive Drug Research Computerized Assessment Battery. Cool, right? And um, traditional uses. Traditionally, peppermint was believed to increase libido and to stop hiccups, to relieve pain in childbirth, reduce bleeding, and to treat uh, menorrhagia or menstrual pain and uh, menstrual irregularity and for gums and there's tons and tons of things. Now, in terms of safety, this is something I, I did, I think is important. Um, this herb is generally very safe when used in regular amounts, but there are a few places where you would not want to use peppermint. 
One is in pregnancy in high amounts, just because it can cause uh, uterine contractions. I think for nausea in pregnancy, it can be really nice when used with other gentle herbs like ginger. And again, you don't need much. And you might even want to do something like the cold water infusion or like, you know, that way you're not getting as many oils out. Um, the other point, time that you would not want to use this is if you have um, esophageal reflux. So if you have, after you eat a meal, you get heart heartburn, you have reflux. One of the things that this herb does is it can relax the esophageal sphincter, which can cause food to then back back up into the throat and to cause heartburn. And that can happen both at the lower sphincter and then at the sphincter of the throat. So if you suffer from reflux, this is not going to be the best herb. Use something like chamomile, catnip, other herbs are going to be a better fit for you. Unless, of course, you're taking the capsule that is enterically coated that goes all the way down into your digestive system and will bypass, um, you know, it will bypass the effects on those smooth muscles. So that is something. There are some other adverse reactions, um, you know, sometimes. Let's see here. So this is mostly contact with the essential oil can cause skin rashes, dermatitis, right? Um, so, you know, there may be, let's see here, cyclosporin, it may, see, these are all the oils though. So I don't want to get into this. This is all like this, if you're taking like drops of the oil um, and yeah, if you're hypersensitive to peppermint oil, don't take it. And it says non, so enterically coated peppermint may be the best uh, choice for those with gastroesophageal reflux symptoms. So there you go. There's the science. Um, tons of it. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. I, I love books like this where you can kind of see the crossover between traditional uses and then modern research and clinical trials. But really, I think peppermint is one that has been grown for thousands of years. It's a delightful one to the senses, really easy to grow, best to be grown in pots so that it doesn't take over your entire garden bed. And then it can, it can be harvested throughout the spring, summer, and even early fall. It will continue to produce. I like to dry my herbs and you can watch a video on this on bundle drying, how to dry your herbs to store them properly for the year ahead. Um, and you can also tincture it. And one of my students asked, why isn't there, you know, peppermint tincture out there? I was like, because people aren't making it, which is really too bad. But I think that that's a really easy herb to also tincture. It works really well in vodka and brandy. And um, it's pretty, really easy to make. And I like to add, I usually typically don't use peppermint tincture on its own. It's one that I like to add into other digestive formulas. So there you have it all. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to my channel. I'm trying to make it to 10,000 subscribers by the end of this calendar year. We're inching up every week. So thank you. Thank you for following me and helping me get my work out there. And if you have any ideas for videos, anything you'd like for me to, to talk about, um, herbs you want me to discuss in future Herb of the Month videos, leave it in the comments. I love hearing from you all. It really makes my day when I see you engaged with my content and asking questions and sharing your experiences and yeah, offering ideas that I can riff off of for future episodes. So thank you all and have a good day.